much of my life, I've been a horse rider for 14 years. I have looked at the concept of motivation over the, those times. I've been in the dressing rooms of coaches as they're trying to encourage athletes to come out and do their best. And I've been in dressing rooms of teams that have not done so well and try to look and understand what the coach does to motivate them for the next time. What is it that God uses to motivate us to serve Him better, to appreciate more who we are? Turn with me for just a moment to Exodus 20, and then we continue our study of the book of Ephesians. When God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, He led them around lest they run into some enemies and be so frightened that they would rush back to Egypt. And he tells them here and gives us his form of motivation. He's about to give them what we would call the Ten Commandments. He's about to give them some rules and some regulations for living. He gives them social commands. He gives them all kinds of direction because they lived in slavery 430 years, they needed the direction. But here's the motivation that he used then. And God spoke all these words, verse, chapter 20, verse 1. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. What God does is remind them of what he's done for them. I am the God who brought you out of Egypt, the land of slavery. And if you think about the writings of the New Testament, in all the epistles, they begin with a list of those things that God has done for us. Ephesians 1, if you'll be turning there, gives us the list of those seven spiritual blessings that have been provided to those who are in Christ. And based upon what God has done for us, chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, chapter 4, there are certain things you must stand for, those seven one principles. There are certain relationships you must excel in, and he looks at the, the husband and the wife, the child, the parents. Based on who we are, based on what God has done for us, there are certain attitudes that we must develop. And that first overriding attitude is that attitude of gratitude. Why are you here today? I hope it's an expression of your gratitude for what God has done for you. What can I do to encourage you to come back? Nothing greater than what God has already done. I can try to persuade you. I can perhaps use guilt. And those things will last for just a short period of time, but they will not stand the test of time. As I began a new ministry with you, I'm using the style that Jesus and God and Paul and others used throughout their ministries to remind you of that which has been done so that you will then want to do certain things. In Ephesians 1, we saw in verse 4 that we were chosen, chosen in him before the creation to be holy, blameless in his sight. God sent a son, Jesus Christ. We chose that son. We are in him as believers. And he reminds us that that was a process that began before the creation of the world. And his desire is that we would be holy and blameless. We would be set apart from those around us. And we would be the kind of people that we need to be. Verse 5, he predestined us to be adopted. When we came into the family of God, it was something predetermined. It was something God chose and he decided ahead of time. And when we came into the family of God, we came in with full family rights. We came in fully ready to serve as a member of that family. And as time ran out, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Saved by grace. Nothing we could ever do to earn it. 
Nothing we could ever say enough. We couldn't attend enough services enough to earn the grace. It's the free gift of God. It's unmerited favor. Here's my definition. God's riches at Christ's expense. We have the riches of God at the expense of the Son of God. At Christ's expense. And that helps us and it should motivate us to appreciate what we have. It's something we should sing about. It's something we, could, we should talk about. It's something we should certainly pray and praise God about. The grace that saves us, something we could never earn, something he gives us, and it's not free. It costs the death of the Son, but it's free to us if we will respond to that which has been done for us. And then he begins discussing one of the definite issues that grabs our attention. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Those last two words tell us that God knew exactly what he was doing. He had an understanding about that process. It tells us that he understood the wisdom of this as he provided that fourth spiritual blessing, redemption, which is also forgiveness of sins. In the Old Testament, they certainly understood the concept of redemption, of buying something and then setting it free, of paying a price that someone could not pay and then letting them go free. And in the New Testament, with six million slaves part of the Roman Empire, they certainly knew the concept of redemption, of someone buying themselves out of that position of slavery and then being set free to serve as a free man, as a free woman. And what Paul reminds us of here is we have been redeemed. We sang that song this morning. I am redeemed by love divine. I am redeemed. And I have forgiveness of sins. Chinese students ask us a lot as we study helping their English by studying the Bible, the book of Luke. And many times they would ask me just right out, why did Jesus come? I said, there are many, many reasons why he came. He came to reveal God to us. He came to die on the cross. But the thing that I say foremost to them is that he came to provide forgiveness of sins. He came to do something I could not do about the sin in my life. And when he forgives that sin, it's out of sight and out of mind. And that's something we need to remember and realize because Satan wants us to be guilty for the rest of our life about something we did a long time ago that God has already forgiven. He's forgotten about it. It's as if it never occurred. I heard a story a number of years ago about a young man who was asked to do a favor for his neighbor. His neighbor asked him for a week to take care of the animals that were in his care. He told them what kinds of food to give them. He told them when they would need to get the food and water. He told them all, he told them all that he needed to hear and then he left town for a week. And the first day, the young man did well. The third day, the young man did well. The fifth day, he did well. But toward the end of the week, his schedule filled up. He became very busy. And he forgot to go feed the animals. And the owner, the neighbor, comes back and realizes there's nothing here. What happened? Of course, he immediately took care of the animals, and he went about his business. And just after the, plot, the neighbor came home, the young man realized, uh-oh, I forgot. I forgot to go take care of the animals. And he went immediately to the presence of the neighbor, and he began to apologize. And the neighbor says, look, I understand. It's okay. I've taken care of it. And he says, but I feel so badly about it. He says, that's okay. Everything was okay. You did great for five days. I came home. The, the animals were okay. Everything's forgiven. You know that word. Everything is forgiven. And the boy dejectedly walked away, feeling terrible about his lack of responsibility toward this good neighbor. 
And in the story, we go forward five years. And five years later, after the young man had left home and he'd gone to school, and he hadn't been home that much, and he hadn't seen the neighbor in much of that time, the young man comes home and he rushes over to the neighbor's house and says, I'm so sorry for what I did. And the neighbor says, what are you talking about? I'm so sorry I didn't feed the animals five years ago. I'm so sorry that, I'm just so sorry. And the neighbor looked at him and says, that is in the past. I told you it's forgiven. And being forgiven means that it's as if it never happened. Being forgiven means it's as if I can't remember what you're talking about, which you didn't. Now, put yourself in that picture spiritually with God as that neighbor and you as that sinning saint, a term we learned in class this morning from 1 John 1. And imagine this picture, coming to God. God, I'm so sorry for what I did. What are you talking about? Well, remember when I was 16 years old and I did, wait, wait, wait a minute. Haven't you confessed that sin to me? Yes. Don't you understand forgiveness? Well, I think so. God wants us to understand that that redemption means someone paid a price I could not pay. They set me free, and it's forgiveness of sins. And God does not remember them. It's that clean slate. It's that guilt-free conscience. We talked about the very first week I was here. And the reality is it's one of the great blessings we have in Christ. And what I like is it's in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Bob Hendren wrote a book for Sweet Publishing a number of years ago, the title Chosen for Riches. He got it from this verse. The riches of God's grace, which he lavished on us. Have you ever had someone lavish gifts of praise or gifts of love upon you? Do you know the word lavish? It's like the best grandmother who's ever walked on the face of the earth. There's always something special there, and she's always free and quick to give it, and she's not keeping account of how many cookies are there. There's no cookie fights with this grandma. When God lavishes something upon us, and here it's the forgiveness in the one he loves, in accordance with his riches, he lavished on us. He understood what he was doing. He used his wisdom to bring us into this circumstance. Lavish means it's given in an overabundance way. There's much and much and much given. And that's the blessing of Christ and the blessing of God. And then he says, verse 9, And he made known to us the mystery of his will. And that's the fifth spiritual blessing. The Jews just could not come to grips with how they could ever be friendly to a Gentile. The Gentiles weren't very friendly to the Jews, and neither like the Samaritans. And in that first century, it was difficult in the ministry of Jesus for them to come to grips that with any reality of understanding that the Jew and the Gentile would ever be together in one group. A mystery is something that once was unknown, but now is clear. And the mystery that God revealed through Christ is that Jew and Gentile alike will be in his church family, will be in the church, that called out body of believers. They didn't understand it. A group met in Acts 15. Jewish Christians, Gentiles had come into the kingdom by then. In Acts 10, Cornelius and his household, Peter told to walk into the house of a Gentile. How in the world am I supposed to do that? I can't do that. He received a vision from God telling the Jew that it's okay to go and enter the doorframe under the doorframe of a Gentile. 
And so you see Jew and Gentile being convinced by God in a vision, it's okay. And when the Spirit came upon Cornelius and his household, Peter then said, oh, now I know that the gospel can be preached to them. And he preached Jesus Christ. They believed they were immersed for remission of sins, received the indwelling Holy Spirit. And Peter told that story over and over, Acts 11, Acts 12, Acts 13, Acts 14. But they called a meeting in Jerusalem so they could figure out what are we going to do with these Gentile Christians? What is it from Judaism that will hold them to, that will bind upon them, so that we can live together as spiritual people? It's a great mystery. Paul says it's a mystery now made clear. All people of the world will be in one spiritual family. All generations of people, all nationalities of people, all dialects of people, American and Chinese, precious to me more than I ever imagined, even three years ago, because I know some Chinese Christians. And there's so much seed, and there will be others to come as God gives the increase. And he's made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. I like this concept of things that please God. It's something that pleased him. It was according to his wisdom and understanding we saw earlier. It's according to his good pleasure that these different groups of people would come together in Christ to be part of this spiritual family. And he says, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. It's not a surprise. It's nothing new from the standpoint of God's plan. And it's when all things from heaven and all things in earth would come together with Christ as the head. What important group have you been a part of in your past? As young people, we were part of sports teams, efforts of hobby, music, whatever it might have been. We felt pretty special because of some achievement level that we reached. As we grew older, we were in clubs at school. Perhaps we were nominated in part of, of the academic clubs social clubs, groups within our community of service organizations. As Christians, what's the one organization that is first on our list? What's the one that motivates us the most to serve other people? What's that one organization that is first and foremost in our thinking? I hope it's the church. I hope it's that group of people in Christ is the head and Paul talks in other places of we're part of that body serving him and each other. That's the organization that's most important to us. And that's the organization, when we understand that we're part of it, that motivates us the most to be and then to do the things that God needs us to do in this place. In him, 11, verse 11, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Those who study Greek and know the Greek language tell us that verses 3 through 14 are one sentence in the Greek. One sentence. I appreciate the English renderings that gives us a chance to catch our breath. But this verse is the one that especially is difficult to attach a spiritual blessing to. Bob Hendren, when he wrote his book, gave us a word that helps to explain it. I haven't found one better. I share it with you today. It's a heritage. He gives us a heritage. He gives us something to look back to, to have pride in. It's something that gave us a place. It gave us a direction. It gave us a focus. 
One of those spiritual blessings specifically is the mystery revealed that there's a group of people coming together with Christ as the head, but it also then gives us a heritage as we look to our past. And I know as I think of my heritage, I'm thankful for my grandparents who loved the Lord with all their heart and soul, strength and mind. And my parents who loved the Lord with all their strength, all their, all the, all the, they have. It's who they are. And I want to be faithful to that heritage. I want to be faithful to the heritage as I look to the New Testament pattern. As Paul takes them back to that time. There's something that's been worked out. It's in conformity with his purpose. It's that we would be the first to hope in Christ. The first generation he's speaking here. And yet we go back and connect to that first generation when we use phrases like, I speak where the Bible speaks. I use chapter and verse. I want to use that apostolic example, that necessary inference. All of those restoration ideas that are part of my heritage, part of your heritage, when all of these things were brought together in some conformity, with some understanding, and of course, and it gives us that hope that we have in Christ. Verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal. And that's the seventh spiritual blessing, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. If you notice this idea of praise to his glory is repeated three times, in him, in Christ, 10 or 15 times, it's all about God, it's all about Christ, but we enjoy the benefits. And one of the benefits is we have a guarantee. It's a deposit that says that this is what's happened now. You were chosen. You were called. It was predetermined for creation. There's grace given to you. There's a mystery revealed to you. All of these things are present, but there's something special coming. And I want you to know about it. And I want you to have confidence in it. And there's the connection of our study of the Sunday school class of the epistle of 1 John. 1 John 5, 13, I write this that you might know that you have eternal life. Kevin studying in John chapter 14, we looked at that Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the paraclete who would come a long time, the counselor, the comforter. I don't think it's an accident that I made some plans of things I wanted to study and it's something being studied by another group in another setting to give us a little depth of understanding. We need to understand that the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, not the miraculous Holy Spirit, but the indwelling Holy Spirit is a guarantee of something to come. What does that mean? If you've ever entered into the job market, earned some money, made plans to buy a house, there's a time when you're asked to depart with some of your money. You go and find the house that you want, and someone says, there's several people looking. What can I do to let my name be first on the list so that I can have some confidence that that house will be mine? Well, I guess you can make a deposit. What's that? You give us some money. And it's a guarantee to us that you're interested in buying that house. It's earnest money. And it means I'm earnestly interested in buying that house. And the beauty of the earnest money is it puts your name at the top of the list if no one else has done that. And the beauty of the earnest is that you can go home knowing that the process can go forward and you will get the house. The other side of the coin we don't like to think about, and that's when I put down deposit or earnest money and I change my mind. Something in my life changes, and you lose your deposit. Mm -hmm. And that's no fun.
one to think about. But see, that's not what this is speaking of. We don't lose anything from the standpoint of what God has given us. This is what God has done on our behalf. When God gave us the Holy Spirit, when we were immersed in Christ, it was telling us there's something better that's coming. And it's a guarantee. It's a deposit of something else coming. And, of course, that is heaven. It's an understanding and an appropriation of those heavenly teachings that all of these epistles are about. It's telling us there's something else coming. And the Spirit is that guarantee. It's that deposit of something else that's coming. And it's unto the redemption of those who are God's possession. There's a time coming when Christ will come again. When he will come again and Christ will judge the church and then Christ will hand the church over to God, 1 Corinthians 15. And that's when we know that we have once and for all attained, brought to fruition, brought to maturity that salvation that all of these verses speak to. And all of these spiritual blessings that Christians possess right now and it has very little to do with us and it has everything to do with God. If we were a youth group, if we were in a BBS setting and we were presenting these things at a childlike level at a more mature level for the youth group, we would do something like this that we're going to do it for all of us as children of God. I want us right now to say thank you, God. Thank you for what you've done. Let's give him a cheer. Let's say thank you. Thank you for doing these things for us. Thank you. Three cheers. You chose us. You saved us. You gave us something that we could never earn. And it's a motivation. It's a motivation for us in remembering these things to set our focus more clearly upon the Lord's church. To set our attention more closely upon each other, horizontally and vertically. To get everything more in sync with what it ought to be. It's an appreciation for what God has done for us and it makes us want to do so much more for Him. Out of duty? No. Maybe initially, but it should be in effect very long as we come to understand God wants us to respond out of gratitude. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the seven spiritual blessings that I have in Christ and is from you and has very little to do with me. And let's lay this aside and let's talk reality for just a few moments. If we're to have the impact in our families, we've got to be more grateful for who we are. And our children need to see it in each of us. Our teenagers deserve to see Christian parents giving themselves fully to each other because of what Christ has given them. Our children need to see our grandparents doing the same thing. This congregation needs to see its shepherds and its servants. You'll notice the two words I use most. The shepherd is the word that best describes what I think an elder is. Bishops biblical. Pastors biblical. Elder is biblical. Shepherd is biblical. And it's the word that I use the most. As they lead us and they know our name and they care for us, they're willing to die for us for the things they say and do to lead us as a body of believers. The deacon is a servant. I tend to use the word that describes the office. We need our shepherds and our servants here every time the door is open. That's a given, isn't it? But isn't it also a given that every member who claims to be a member of the body of Christ ought to be fully devoted to the cause of Christ? We want to come and encourage each other. We want to be here to learn and to study. Faith comes by 
hearing, hearing by the word of God? Have you become so faithful that you're just filled up and don't need to come and study the word of God? If that's the case, I need you here to encourage me because I haven't attained that yet. If you've attained something and you don't need it, then come be the one to help give to those of us who haven't attained. Is it because Gary says it? No. Is it out of guilt? I hope not. It's because of who we are and what God has done for us. And that's why this is the place to be on Sunday morning, on Sunday night, and Wednesday night, Lord willing, based on your schedule. The question I've been asked for many, many years, Gary, I work during those times. I'm thankful for it. When you're not working, are you here? I think that's what God is most interested in. If you could be here, are you here? And if you work on Sunday, so do I. So do I. But are you able to be here? And when you're able, are you here? That's what God wants to know. It's not guilt. It's not because a new guy has come in. It's because of an understanding of what God has done for me. And it's my way of saying, I appreciate what you've done for me. And it's also realizing that that mystery is that called that body believers, the first century Christians, were pulled together as a group of people. And they couldn't wait to be together. They couldn't wait to study together. They wanted to eat together. They were willing to sell of their possessions to meet the needs that was among them. That radical church we talked about two weeks ago. This needs to be a radical church in that way. We can't wait to be together. We, we just want to be together. And you know the other motivation? Because we have men who watch for our souls. Those shepherds. They will answer in judgment one day for how they watched for our souls. And they decided that one of the endeavors of theirs is that we need to provide an avenue where we can be together, where we can grow horizontally, where we can grow intellectually, emotionally, psychologically. We need times of fellowship. We need times of Bible study. If we're going to put the best teachers we have in front of you. We want you to come and eat of the food that's being provided. And not like the Hebrew writer that says, whereas you ought to be teachers, you're still in need of milk. The inference is that we need to be growing in our knowledge of God's Word. You don't grow in your knowledge of God's Word watching the 49ers on television at 6.07 this evening. Tape it. I'm going to. I'm going to keep up with it at some point. There's ways to do several things and fit God's plan. But I'm going to honor the shepherds as head of this congregation under the headship of Christ of using my intellect to follow their direction so that I can grow and I want the same for you. Why? If it's because of me, the new guy, it won't last very long. And that's not what I want. When I'm dead or gone, whenever that time comes, it needs to be in place permanently. Is it out of guilt? That won't last very long. Satan's going to work and he's going to let you feel very comfortable coming up with all kinds of excuses of why you can't do this or this or this or this. And all of it will seek to nullify the reality of what God has done for us in this attitude of gratitude. And this attitude of gratitude says, I can't do enough, but I'm willing to begin, and I want to serve you to the best of my ability, and I'm a member of the Sunset Avenue Church of Christ. By the way, I'm confused. I have to admit. There's a website, Madera Church of Christ. Is that us? I think it is. And then in reading some of the history of this congregation, there's about four names that I can find. So there's several names in the history of the congregation, apparently. But on the site,
sign, Sunset Avenue Church of Christ, in the bulletin, Sunset Avenue Church of Christ, and it's one of the congregations in Madeira, and you, if you're a member here, need to act like it. We need you here, encouraging us, so we can encourage you, so we can make a difference in our homes, and in our neighborhoods, and in our community, and in the state of California, and believe me, this state needs it. This state needs the encouragement of a Bible-believing, Christ-following congregation and city and county. Are you ready to sign up? Guess what? You already have. If you're in Christ, you signed up a long time ago for some of us. It's time now to step up. We signed up a long time ago. Now it's time to step up and let the blessings of Christ and the blessings of God motivate us to make a difference in our world. If you're not in Christ, this message was to those who are in Christ. But it certainly encourages us to receive the information, to understand what he's offering for us. The fact that we can choose to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We can repent of our sins, receive the forgiveness, the redemption that we spoke of. The grace that saves us as we respond to what God has done for us in Christ. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, we want to talk to you and study with you. We will not pressure you. We want to deal with it from a common sense point of view. If it makes sense, come to think about it. Come to believe it, if you will and make that important decision. My children asked me when they were younger, Dad, does it disappoint you when you work so hard and you preach a sermon and no one comes forward? I said it doesn't, because I know this has already taken place. Around the communion table, people have set themselves straight before God already. And we did that this morning before the sermon was ever begun. Sitting here this morning, I know some of you are saying, you know what, I'm going to do better. I did sign up. I'm in Christ. I have an attitude of gratitude. I'm going to act on it more and more. I'm going to remember those spiritual blessings, and I'm going to stand up more and more because I'm a member of the body of Christ. And I know some of you have done that. Let's stand and sing. Spirit, Lord, I need restored. I thought. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. 
Christ is mine, all to him I now resign. Shall we pray? Our loving and kind Heavenly Father, we come to you now to close this service once again, thanking you for the many wonderful gifts that you bless us with in this life. But None, other, none greater than the gift of your Son who came and lived upon this earth, died and overcame death, that we could have the promise of life everlasting with you. Father, we pray that we can live a life each and every day that is thankful of that sacrifice and one that is worthy of that sacrifice, that we can be the light that you would have us to be, that you would be the guide that you would have us to be in this world that we live in. Father, we ask your blessings on this church, that this church here in Madera could be the kind of church that you would have us be, that we can go out to the community and spread your love and your gospel. Praise to be with those that are not here this morning for other reasons, whatever they, whether they are spiritual or emotional or physical, that you would comfort them, that you would strengthen them, that we can encourage them to be back here with us again. Father, wash your constant care and love all of us. In your son's holy name, amen.